So I'm just going to go through these slides quite quickly because we've only got three quarters of an hour between the two of us. So I'm just going to go through these topics. So I'm covering wet etching, which covers sort of cleaning and etching of features. Um, so Caillou has spoken for a while about how to deposit things on, so now we're going to tell you how to then get them back off again. So why wet etching? Well, wet etching is cheap, it's easy, it's probably the first kind of etching that was introduced into, into industry. It, it was uh, an intuitive method to etch uh, a material off a surface. Um, it's very selective as well, so if you've got two materials, you can selectively etch one, ma one material, not touch the other, so it's, it's very good in that sense. Um, so we can remove uh, sacrificial layers, so when it comes to doing MEMS type devices, we can, we can remove one layer, not touch another, and then you're left with the, the final structure. Um, we can also etch metals quite easily. To, to etch metals in, in a dry etch system, then generally we need chlorine, which needs a lot of safety systems, so it's quite expensive. So we don't have chlorine here. So if we want to etch metals, we have to do it uh, chemically. Um, it's cheap, as I mentioned, and also you can do batch processing as well, if need be. Um, so there's a few, I'll skip through this bit, um, but it, it's fairly basic. Um, selectivity I mentioned, etch rate, obviously how much you can etch over a, a period of time. Um, uniformity, um, if you're etching on a wafer and you're etching across, say, a six inch wafer, then you want to make sure you get the same etch rate in the middle as you do at the edge. Um, with chemical etching, it's quite hard to control, but there are certain things that you can do, like using a, a, a stirrer or, or a heat bath to, to improve the uniformity. Uh, and then also the etch profile. So generally, wet etching is isotropic, meaning it etches in all directions at once, um, unlike dry etching. But there are a few exceptions to that. Um, I'll skip these slides just now. Uh, well, I guess just comment on that bit over there. So the reason that wet etching isn't really used too well to, to define critical layers is because it's hard to uh, control the etch profile. So down here you can see it's, all, it's isotropic, so it's curved. So this is your starting lithography mask, and then down here your, your final feature is much smaller. So it's harder to control uh, critical dimensions. So the difference between isotropic etching and anisotropic etching is this is isotropic, so it's etching in all directions at once, and then over here um, we've got a straight wall. So with dry etching we tend to have that straight wall down here. Okay. So what is wet etching? It's the transfer of a reactant across a boundary layer. So when you put your substrate into a chemical it forms a boundary layer across the, the whole um, device. Um, so in that boundary layer, it's just sort of static. Um, liquid isn't really doing anything, it's fully reacted, so you need to get that reactant across the, the boundary layer from here, get it to react on the surface, and then take the reactant, the product away. So things you can do, you can heat the bath to increase this reaction rate, to increase etch rate. Um, you can also stir um, the, the beaker as well to uh, which reduces the boundary layer and increases the transport of um, etchant across that boundary layer. Um, so some common etches in the, in the clean room. Um, so common materials that we need to etch. So silicon dioxide is a common one where we need to do HF etching. Um, silicon, uh, KOH, which is the only sort of anisotropic etch. Well, there's, there's a few options for isotropic etching of silicon. Um, we've also got a xenon difluoride uh, etching system in the, in the clean room as well for uh, etching of silicon isotropically. Um, and there's a few other etches here as well. If you need to do wet etching of silicon nitride, you can, but generally you would use a, a dry etch system to do that. And generally metals, we buy pre-mixed uh, chemicals in order to etch these things, but they're readily um, etchable. That's the term. So for photoresist, they're easy. We just chuck them. Well, for positive photoresist, we just throw them into a uh, solvent, so acetone, isopropanol. And then we can do a final clean with piranha that Elliot mentioned earlier. Uh, for negative photoresist, they are um, generally cross-linked, quite hard to get off. So we've got to use either use a, a plasma, an oxygen plasma, or we can use uh, N-methylpyrrolidone or we can do piranha as well uh, to help remove these things. And SUA, it's virtually impossible to get off, but 
there's certain uh, dry etching you can do. So uh, I just want to touch on anisotropic etching of silicon because we did use that, and I used that in an example this morning for the silicon nitride membranes. Um, so silicon, to understand that, you need to understand silicon a little bit. So um, we use this Krachowski method for growing silicon. But we don't. We buy the silicon wafers in. And it forms in this sort of diamond cubic structure. Um, and depending on how it's grown, the orientation of how it's grown, and how it's sliced, you get different orientations of uh, wafers. So meaning from the top down as you look at it, so when we buy, we talk about 100 silicon, 111 silicon, it means the orientation of the silicon looks like that from the surface, or looks like that, or looks like that. So generally, we buy this 100 silicon in. That's the, the typical substrate we use. And what happens then is, um, I'll just skip that part. So when we etch it with um, KOH, for example, uh, temperature, then it's very, the edge rate is heavily dependent on the crystal orientation. So uh, at 100, we get nearly a micron a minute, depending on the conditions up here. 111 is even faster, and sorry, 110 is even faster, but 111 is very, very slow. So we tend to find that it etches down and exposes the 111 plane, which it barely etches. So for 100 silicon, we get this etch angle at 54.7 degrees. And I don't know if you remember the picture that I showed this morning of the, of the nitride window. You could see this um, angled plane uh, on, the, on the membrane. And then I've never actually done this with 110 silicon, but you can actually etch trenches directly down into it, um, exposing some other planes down here. So the, the, um, the reaction is it's more effective at temperature. So this is a KOH concentration versus etch rate. So you actually find that, well, with temperature, as you might expect, the etch rate goes up. But with increased concentration of KOH, it actually starts to go down the etch rate. But it does improve the surface finish of the, of the final etch. So sometimes it's better to use a, a sort of concentration of about 30% KOH. And then we end up with this kind of structure at the end. So it looks um, beautiful and clean in the middle there, but around the edge it looks quite um, bad. But that's because of outside corners, you're exposing different uh, silicon planes there. So you get some funny etching going around in the corners. But what you can do is you can design for that. You can design dummy features in corners that will preferentially etch first. And then you can end up with a sort of final square structure. And that's where you would go back and use like IntelliSense software to um, go and model um, the etching. So it's, it's it, I wouldn't say it's quick and dirty, it's cheap and dirty. <laughs> but it, you know, an etch right through a silicon wafer can take 10 hours. But it's something you can start the night before and, and, and come and um, deal with it the next day. But you need to, um, because it etches silicon and it really, KOH is in fact a uh, photoresist developer, so you can't use photoresist as the mask. Um, so you have to use something like silicon nitride. So you can buy wafers in, or you can order it from other uh, ANFF nodes to um, put silicon nitride down and use that as, a, as an etch barrier. Um, so you can improve it again by adding isopropanol to the KOH solution, and that again, that improves the surface roughness. And in addition, you can also use another chemical instead, TMEH, um, which if you need it to be metal ion free, if there was going to be electronics in your final device. Um, unfortunately, I think you need a, an import license in order to obtain over 20% strength TMEH now. So this is what I was saying is designing dummy structures into the corner. So this is the final structure here, like here. But in order to obtain that, we had to design these sort of corners into it in order to, to get that final structure. But it, it's quite simple. It's quite cheap. But um, you get good results with it. Um, so you can also do isotropic etching of silicon, which is a mixture of nitric and HF. So the nitric sort of decomposes into uh, 
nitrogen dioxide, which oxidizes silicon in the HF, and it um, will remove that H uh, oxide. But it's, uh, it's an isotropic H as opposed to the, the KOH one. Um, this one is quite good. So we have a zinc difluoride etcher in the clean room. Um, so zinc difluoride, it's, it's a powder. And um, when you, you expose it to a vacuum, it begins to sublimate. And then that gas comes up, and it can react with the silicon. Um, the main advantage of using zinc difluoride as opposed to any other kind of silicon etch is it's, it creates a, a stiction-free um, etch. So if you were making a, like this example down here, which was from physics, uh, if you etch it in a wet chemical, as it begins to dry, you get a capillary effect that pulls it down and it sticks to the surface. <coughs> so with the, it's almost like gas phase etching, you don't, it's completely stiction free. So it's, it's perfect for the release of MEMS devices. Okay, but it only etches silicon. Um, it can etch uh, a few different materials, so mainly silicon, which is probably mostly used for here, as well as um, lignum, germanium, silicon germanium. And at temperature, you can etch these ones too, but we don't have a heated um, chamber in ours. And then you can use any of these materials as a mask. Basically, it doesn't touch uh, most of these materials at all. So. So it's very good at selectively taking off silicon. So if you want silicon, it's great. If you don't, it's not so good. Um, so etch stops. Do you need on now? <laughs> so uh, etch stops. So it's, it's difficult. If you want an, uh, a trench, say, of a certain depth, then you need to you need to time it, characterize it, and time it, which is very difficult. So sometimes it's easier just to use an etch stop. So you just put material on the back of it and etch all the way through. So like we did with the, the silicon nitride membrane. I'll skip these next two. It's just some more etch stop techniques. I'll skip that one. HF. Um, so HF is really, I mean, you can do dry etching of silicon dioxide, absolutely, but if you want to use it as a release mechanism, you want to completely etch away some silicon, then sometimes you've got to use hydrofluoric acid. Um, so we've got two options. We've got the full strength 49% uh, HF, or we can use a buffered, buffered oxide etch, which uses ammonium fluoride as the, as the buffer to slow down the etch. So the, only, the main thing to say about HF is it will kill you. So Somebody died in Western Australia because they spilt some down their leg. They got about 10% coverage. He jumped into the swimming pool. He thought he'd neutralized it, but he hadn't. The fluorine then attacked him, got into his bones, went to casualty that night. They took his leg off, and then a few hours later, he was dead. So that's why if you don't have to do HF, then don't. If you do have to do HF, then you have to convince us <laughs> that you really have to do it and you have no option. So it's available, but it's, yeah, it's deadly. OK. So yeah, so it's actually not a particularly strong acid. So particularly with the buffered oxide version, it's, it's not. You don't feel it. And it looks like water, so you don't actually know if you've got it on you. So you have to, if you think you've got it on, you rub calcium gluconate in and then go to casualty. But anyway, that's a discussion for another time. Um, so cleaning, I'll just quickly cover cleaning. Um, so I think the other guys have covered why we have to have um, things clean in the clean room, but it can really play havoc with photolithography. So, and we have all sorts of sources of particles. And although we have HEPA filtered air um, in the clean room and our air is very clean, there's all sorts of other sources of particles that we need to avoid in humans. That's probably the worst one. But we still let humans in there because we have to. So um, we bring our own particles in, but we've got to try and remove them. So um, uh, Elliot's already mentioned uh, piranha cleaning. So it's good for removing organics and ionic contamination and other metallics. Uh, but <laughs> back to safety, I've been involved in two OHNS incidents, and both of them include, uh, involved piranha etching, and both have involved where the, the, the acid was poured into a container and sealed, and then has, has exploded because it's an exothermic reaction that's ongoing. So uh, we will train you in the appropriate use <laughs> at the time. Um, 
So uh, piranha cleaning is one. Actually, in the industry, they tend not to use that. They tend to use something called RCA cleaning, which was developed by the Radio Corporation of America, um, which has these different um, steps within here. They call it SC1, which is used to remove um, particles and other contamination. Then there's an oxide strip, which is HF, um, which is used to remove any kind of native oxide from the surface, and then the rest of the contaminants come off. And then this is less important for us because we're not tend not to be doing electronics, but um, in the semiconductor industry, um, ionic contamination will kill uh, transistors. So uh, they do this second step here, and then they do a rinse and, and nitrogen. Okay, that's all I've got to say. <laughs> okay, I will talk about the etching. We just uh, previously we just I just talk about the. Uh, thin film deposition. Right now, we're talking about the opposite process, just to etch something. So, where is the? So, for this talk, I will cover introduction to the dry etch and the dry etching overview, and then including the plasma etching, physical uh, physical etching, IDI, and uh, followed by the etching chemistries and uh, dry etching process trend and. Uh, at the end of the talk, I will talk about the etching issue and the solutions. So first, we we'll introduction to dry etching. Uh, the etching is the process which you need to uh, permanently transfer the pattern into the surface area of a substrate. The lithography process just to temporarily transfer the pattern onto your substrate. You need something to etch to permanently keep this pattern. So you need this etching process. Dry etching process is different from wet etching. Uh, Doug just mentioned the wet etching process is to carry out in the wet chemical process. The dry etching process, the, we uh, <coughs> uh, carry out the process in the gases phase, mainly in plasma based environment the usually is uh, called plasma based etching process. So why dry etching? So compost dry uh, wet etching dry etching has so many advantages. So the first one is cleaning processes. So all the processes carry out in under the vacuum so you can keep the dust free, everything is a vacuum. And uh, the second one is to eliminate the handling of dangerous chemicals. So you do need to handle the chemical in the, in the chemical bath or tanks or the beakers. So you just put the wafer into the, the chamber, then you run the process. So dry etching will have uh, better CD control, that means critical dimension control, and a small feature size achievable. And uh, some material like sealing carbon, it's very hard to wet etch, and then you have to use dry etch. And uh, uh, anisotropy or isotropic etching is controllable. And uh, also, uh, uh, directional etching is achievable. So, uh, Doug just mentioned, I just quickly go through. So, we have uh, using the uh, dry etching, we can also uh, achieve a different kind of etching profile, like isotropic etching and uh, anisotropic etching, and completely anisotropic. So, how we uh, can characterize the etching process. So the first will be the etching rate, then followed by the uniformity, and the, the profile. So you need to look at the surface, uh, the side or angle, whether it's isotropic or anisotropic. And the last one is very important, is the selectivity. So the selectivity, that means the, the, reach, uh, the reach of the etching rate of the near to be etched and the near not to be etched. So the selectivity, including the selectivity to masking material and to the material underneath the material to be etched. So usually selectivity, if it's greater than four, that means it's good. If it's greater than two, it's okay, acceptable. It means the high is better, definitely. So next I will talk about the different uh, etching technique. So for dry etching, we have uh, there are a few different etching techniques, including physical etching, chemical etching, reactive ion etching, and the deep reactive ion etching. So first uh, is physical etching. Physical etching is just use uh, 
the physical bombardment with signs, right, item to strike your the service. Uh, argon is most commonly used signs, and this is highly anisotropic. Selectivity is very low because the edge, the eyes will edge the whole, the whole, the surface. And the sputter rate is very low. So this process is quite similar as what I talk about this, the sputtering process. It's quite similar as that process. So this process is usually used for cleaning of substrate before, uh, prior to the deposition. So not many people use this process for etching substrate, just for pre-cleaning. And uh, the next one is the plasma etching. So plasma etching, so it's pure chemical etching. So, so this uh, etching process usually is done at the high pressure, and uh, which give you a very high selectivity because the etching gas is only react with the material which is going to react, and it's highly isotropic etching. So this process is uh, widely used in pro oxygen plasma etch to remove the photoresist. Like the barrel etch is a typical plasma etch. And uh, the next one is a reactive iron etch. So this is uh, like uh, all the industry people, they use uh, this iron etch. So this etch is combined the benefit of both uh, plasma etch and the physical etching process. So they usually use the parallel electrical ones on the top ones on the bottom. So the top one usually as the anode, the bottom one usually as the ca cathode. So where you weave a seed here. And uh, the critical parameter for the eye is the DC bias which is applied to the substrate. And uh, actually the eyes doesn't, eyes don't contribute directly to the etching, just help to enhance the chemical etching. This is just to help the physical bombard the surface to create some fresh surface for the chemical uh, reaction. So I just uh, want to talk about this. This is one of the terminologies called DC bias. And DC, DC bias usually it's, the, it's not a parameter which you can set in your process control, but you do use this uh, bias, and this bias is not an uh, external voltage, it's controlled by electron density. So the, usually the ions are much heavier and move slowly, so only the electron got accelerated by electric field and jump into the electrode, and which uh, create the potential dense usually we call the, uh, the self-bias. So what fact will impact the DC bias? So the first one is physical one is the, the area of surface of the electrode, one, like uh, anode electrode and the uh, bottom uh, cathode electrode. But once the machine is there, it, you cannot change it's there. So the pressure and uh, the power will change the biasing. Another concept is the iron sheath. So this is also called dark space. This usually people don't, uh, are not aware of this because inside the plasma, you can see the plasma, you, but some people may know that here, this is a dark uh, space. Usually there's no plasma in here. The, here, like this is the chamber. So, so this, this, uh, Dark space usually is a few uh, millimeters thick, and uh, if we if we increase the so the iron sheet thickness is inversely proportional to the plasma density and the pressure. So if you have a lower pressure, then this will be reduced and. Uh, so once the ion distance is reduced, so it's, uh, if the plasma is moved to here, so you will have less uh, distance. So you will uh, reduce the ion scattering because there's no much room for ion sc uh, scattering. So then you will have more directional etching. 
So the next uh, we will uh, I will um, talk about the DIE. So we have uh, so many etchings, so physical etching, plug etching, I. Why we need a DI, uh, deep reactive IH? So this is uh, bring to the to the market because uh, when the MEMS devices come to, uh, to uh, for application, so we need some tools to make a very complicated structure. So with a very high rate, high aspect ratio, and uh, the the side wall of the uh, the the etching must be very vertical. So there's some typical uh, pick, uh, device, the structure we made in our vicinity. So uh, DI, uh, there's uh, two types of DI. So one is cryo DI, one is the DI, uh, ICP DI. Another one is called ECR, but right now it's the, this mainstream is ICP DI. So uh, cryo DI is the first uh, DI was uh, invented in the market. So they use very low temperature at minus 100 degree and to etch the silicon. The problem with this process is the mask may get cracked and this is extremely cold because minus 100 degree. So resist cannot survive. So you have to think about another mask material. So after that, so this ICP DIE comes to the market, then this is a breakthrough to the the uh, silicon etching process. So this process usually we call the Bosch process. So in this process, we use uh, CFFE, this is called deposi uh, deposition uh, gas, and the SF6 for etching process. So this process is a cycle. So we etching, we, after that we uh, pass vision, then etch, pass vision. So this uh, sequence, then we can keep etching to very deep silicon. So the benefit of the DI is the, the higher etching rate, the, we can achieve high aspect ratio, and the selectivity is very good. And especially the sidewall profile is close to 90 degree. So that's the uh, I, uh, ICP DI system which we are using. So this system, they are using two uh, RF power. One is ICP power. One is bias and power. So there's a two RF power sources. So this is one typical uh, DIE process we're using in our facility. So this, uh, our process is a little bit different from others. So usually people like uh, etching, uh, passivation, etching, passivation. For what we do, we, we passivation first. We use SF6 to passivation first. Then after that, we etch to remove the passivation layer, polymer layer here. Uh, uh, once you exposed the silicon to the environment, then we use another uh, Edge step SF6 to isotropy edge the silicon here. So this is a typical uh, etching recipe you can see here. We have a deposition first, then we have there's a two uh, etching step. So in this uh, etching first etching step, we apply this little higher bias voltage. So we want to have uh, the high energy ions to strike the the surface to remove the polymer. And then we, have, we use another etching step, uh, step to isotropically etch the silicon. So compare <coughs> the, these two different uh, techniques. So sparkling uh, etching usually gives you a very high anisotropic etching. And uh, plasma etching gives you very high selectivity because this is a pure chemical reaction. So uh, reactive ion etching is to combine these two etching um, property uh, features, give you uh, an isotropic etch. So the sputtering etch, the etching rate is very low compared with others. And the DIE, uh, no doubt they give you a very high etching rate, five micron is uh, normal. Some people can reach like 20 micron per minute, and it's highly, Anisotropic, so selectivity also very high. And uh, I will next we'll move to etching chemistry. 
So for different uh, film, we will use different edge uh, gases to etch it. So for organic film, we usually use the oxygen to um, etch the photoresist. We also use CF4 and oxygen to etch some polymer film. And for oxide and nitride film, we use uh, fluorine plasma to etch. That's, uh, so if you, for the process, if you add some oxygen, you can increase the etching rate. If you in, uh, add in the fluorine, you can give you increase the etching rate. And for silicon, there's a different, um, there are also most people, uh, most of our people using fluorine based gas, uh, like uh, SF6, CF4, CF4 to use uh, silicon. For polysilicon, people right now, people tend to use HBR. Um, to etch polysilicon because uh, right now we are talking about the technology like a 14 nanometer or something uh, which requires a very high etching uh, standard. So the et you need to have very low etching rate and the isotropic has to be highly anisotropic because you only have uh, uh, 14 nanometer. You cannot have any isotropic etch which will uh, give you very uh, bad uh, CD control. So uh, the metal etch usually we use uh, chlorine-based plasma to etch the, pl uh, the metals. So uh, s there's so many uh, different gases for etching. So how to select different gases? So different, usually different uh, manufacturers, even different wafer fab, they're using different gases. So, so the first you, the gas you choose has to be uh, able to react with the material. And the next one will be selectivity. And the, uh, the another one is the result in volatile byproduct with no vapor pressure. Because all the byproducts you want to be easy to take away by the exhaust. So it just shows some idea this uh, the fluorine and the carbon ratio effect on the uh, polymerization. So usually a uh, higher fluorine carbon ratio needed to the more etching, the lower they needed to more passivation. So adding more hydrogen will consume uh, the uh, flor fluorine, which reduce will need to lower the, the etching rate. So adding the oxygen will consume the carbon, that one increase the etching rate. And uh, there's some effect of oxygen uh, um, percentage uh, in the gas of uh, CL4. So from this figure, you can see that uh, usually this, uh, if you with different uh, percentage of oxygen, you will have a different uh, etching rate uh, to the silicon and the silicon dioxide. So you need to carefully uh, uh, optimize your process to get the best selectivity. So that's uh, typical, uh, there's a etching recipe which uh, in our facility we are using the Oxford etcher. So we have a uh, recipe for silicon dioxide etch, nitrate etch, silicon etch, and silicon carbon etch. So you can look at it here, the selectivity to, uh, to photoresist is not great, but it's acceptable, it's about two to three to one, there's a selectivity. So, and the etching rate is about, uh, it's 40 to 60 nanometer per minute. So next I will talk about this, the etching trend. Uh, so if you increase the pressure for some like a chemical reaction, you will have the higher etching rate because uh, increase the pressure, you will have a more chemical insight. So, but this will invest, they will reduce the, the, pre, uh, the etching rate for the uh, eye. So the power, so generally if you increase the RF power, you will have all uh, the etching rate higher in all these uh, three different etching technique. Because uh, you have a higher RF power, you will have uh, more uh, iron go ionized, and uh, you will increase the iron density. Iron density. So there's another trend that's for undercut. So this is also uh, 
the process we need to look at. So if you increase the gas flow, you will increase the chemical reaction. So more chemical reaction, so that means more undercut. If you increase the pressure, you will have uh, the same, you will have more chemical inside, you will have more undercut. But for RF power, if you increase the RF power, you will have more uh, the iron density. You will have a higher uh, bias, and you will have a higher iron, uh, iron density. So you will have uh, the higher rate of uh, for this uh, physical action. So that's a trend for DIE. So generally for DIE, if you increase anything for RF power, for bias power, process pressure, and uh, gas flow, you will increase the etching rate. For DIE is different from other processes. They also have an etching cycle. So if you increase the etching cycle, you will increase the etching rate. So if you increase the etching cycle, then uh, you will reduce the passivation cycle you will have less passivation. So the next the part I will talk about the etching issue we have during the etching process. That's one typical uh, etching issue. It's called aspect ratio dependent etching. So in this um, issue, so, so the etching rate will decrease when the aspect ratio increases. This the etching we have done. You can see clearly if the etching aspect ratio increase, you will get very the depths get shallow and shallow. So this is the pure physical etching. So how to solve this issue? So you have to reduce the 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 pressure to reduce the to have the more directional etching. Another issue is the loading or micro loading effect. This is very common. Um, issue in the etching process. So this is the chemical etching process. Usually the large open area basically consume more fluorine gases. So, so this the etching rate usually is slower in this dense pattern area. You can see here. So this is uh, loose, uh, less um, dense area. You can very have a deep etching. So pattern with the open not the open area may etch slower because here you consume etch more uh, silicon. So the solution, there's no uh, much uh, good solution for a uh, process. The only way you can probably you can reduce the etching rate. Another ideal the solution is to when you design your the pattern, your mask, you need to think about this issue so you can incorporate this issue into your uh, your design to minimize the optimal exposed silicon area if possible. Another issue is uh, lodging. So this only happens when you etch your SOI substrate. So because there's a silicon oxide underneath, once the silicon etch reach the oxide, so the etching will keep going on because uh, this is a silicon dioxide. So, so there will, there's no much uh, reaction from here. So the ions will deflect to the, the corner, so they will break the passivation layer and the result is some isotropic etching. So to solve this issue, you can use the higher pressure to reduce the ion charging and minimize the over etching time. So once it's reaching to the silicon dioxide, you have to stop the etching. And uh, right now in some advanced uh, the equipment in machine, so they have a very good endpoint detector. So this can monitor how deep it goes. So in the uh, last few slides, I just showed there's some uh, work we have done in our vicinity. So I just want to compare the different etching result using all this uh, isotropic etching and isotropic etching. So we are starting with this uh, uh, mask pattern, this with uh, DOS. So after that, we doing using the lithography process. We just transfer the pattern to the silicon wafer. So after that, 
then we use uh, DIA to etch this wafer. So after etching, we will get a uh, micro peanut like that. So if you want a shallow, you want you just etch uh, maybe less time cycle, you will get like uh, like a 50, uh, 60 micron. If you want deeper, we can keep etching until whatever you want. So another one, we just, we will use uh, isotropic etch to etch this wafer. So because it's isotropic etch, so you will see the horizontal etching and the isotropic etching. So if you keep etching, so this side, two sides will meet together, will pinch off this the head, then become after the pinch off, this become like a tips is here. So we also can use uh, an isotropic etch, which to mix uh, different gases, CS, CS, uh, SF6, CFF, A, and argon, to have uh, an isotropic etch. That this different from isotropic because isotropic usually give you um, a little bit short uh, tips. This one give you longer tip. So after pinch off, you get you get a little bit longer and sharp tips. Another one is we combine isotropic edge Bosch process and isotropic edge. So first we will etch this top part and to get some kind of uh, isotropic edge structure. After that, we use Bosch process to etch down to the height which you required. So after that, we use another isotropic edge to remove the top part, then becomes like a nano patch, which uh, we have done lots of work for this one. Yeah, so there's some reference you can uh, look at after this uh, workshop. Is there any question?